Hi, everyone.、Uh, it's so wonderful to see all of you here today. The topic today is very close to my heart. For the past seven years, I've dedicated myself to advocating for multicultural research, understanding, and engagement. It has been a journey filled with a lot of challenges, but also incredibly rewarding. Despite the progress we have made, there are still significant gaps in both understanding and the application of multicultural research, communication, and market activation. Today, with the help of my brilliant panel, we are going to dive into these critical issues. Together, we will seek answers by asking right questions and exploring new insights and business opportunities. Now let me introduce my panel. First, Derek, do you want to wave your hand? <laughs> Derek is first generation Chinese Australian marketer, currently managing lamb at Meat and Livestock Australia. Growing up in Hong Kong and Australia in nineties, he has navigated cultural contrasts and unique challenges of blending Chinese and Australian identities. Since joining MLA, Derek has led two of most successful summer lamb campaigns in the brand's 20-year history, focusing on uniting Australians through impactful messaging. I'm sure everyone has seen the generation gap ad that has been viewed over 24 million times. One of few very important awards. Sasha, Sasha, do you want to wave your hand? Sasha is Australian who has lived in China, Germany, and Jamaica for half of his life. He has worked in government, academia, and industry. He is an evidence-based strategist and speaks three languages fluently. Has a PhD in anthropology and hosts a well-known podcast that talks about inspiring stories of people who moved abroad. Tom, do you want to wave your hand? <laughs> Tom is Tom's connection with China and the cross-border industry began in 1980s, and since then he has been deeply and meaningfully involved in enhancing bilateral relationships, trade policies, and social and cultural understanding between China and Australia. I had a privilege. Of working with Tom briefly at Bastion six years ago, and he's currently the national CEO of Australian China Business Council. Many of many of you might not know this. He was responsible for convincing AFL and helping deliver games of footy in Shanghai. Now, last but not least, Carissa. Carissa, do you want to wave your hand? We has. She has more than twenty years career in marketing, strategy, and brand management. Born and raised in Sydney, with Hungarian Jewish father, lived in London and New York before returning to Australia. Currently, she is the chief growth officer at Cultural Pulse and passionate about creating positive、uh, changes. Now let's dive into the topics. First, let's talk about the size of price. We have large and growing multicultural population, and this untapped market in Australia. This isn't often reflected in the target research and marketing activation. Tom,、uh, I'm going to start with you. Would you like to share your thoughts and experience? Uh, thanks, Isabel, and hi everyone.、Um, yeah, look, I think one of the things when I was working、uh, both at Bastion and then also at、um, at the AFL was that、uh, we we looked at、uh, I guess the overall、um, size of the Chinese speaking、um, uh, I guess population, where so whether that's heritage based speakers、um, as well as、uh, international students. Um, tourists,、um, as well as the migrant、um, population. Again, this is very much specific just to the Chinese Australian、um, communities,、um, and the size of that actual market、uh, was bigger than Queensland, Western Australia, South Australia, Tasmania, and the Northern Territory combined. So, as a size of an actual market,、um, it was significant.、Um, On on actual numbers, that's only part of the story、um, because pre COVID,、um, as many people would be aware and remember,、uh, 
um, Chinese tourists and inbound tourists sort of accounted for about 1.4 uh, million visitations. But more than anything, what was um, staggering about that was um, the gifting culture from a Chinese perspective um, and that the average spend of a, a Chinese tourist uh, was around eight to nine thousand um, dollars per visit which was um, larger than the next three countries combined and what it also provided for some brands uh, was an opportunity of a of a kind of a grey market or a, or an export channel for those visitors and as a way to kind of to test and to sample so again um, it's one of those areas that I think um, some brands and some um, organizations aren't particularly aware of um, actually, um, I guess, the diversity and the size within those communities. Thanks, Izzy. Right. Well, Sasha, what's your view on this? Thanks, Isabel. Um, so good morning, everybody. Uh, so um, I read a book recently, well, I'm halfway through a book, and it talks about how reading fiction, so bear with me, everyone, how reading fiction helps you be more empathetic and understanding of other people uh, and of other uh, other people's cultures and kind of taking a leaf from the scene that that Tom has set and the size of the prize. Uh, I just want to deep dive briefly into what it's like to be a migrant coming to Australia and to really highlight the role of empathy that we can bring as executives uh, and as marketers to, um, to our job. It's often many, many years of planning that people put in, in coming, uh, in moving country and coming to a place like Australia. Something like five years uh, is, not, is not unreasonable. It's very, very common. The, the, the amount of financial investment, time investment and sacrifices that um, that immigrants make is something that is very hard for us to comprehend if we haven't done, done that ourselves. However, we can build our empathy by uh, just by being open and being open to different ways of living and, and open to their experiences. And there are two experiences in particular that I think uh, we can pay attention to. I mean, there's there's many actually, but two come to mind really, really, um, really profoundly. Mm -hmm. The first is maybe a bit of a cliche, but it's digital experiences. Now, uh, particularly in Asia, but not just in Asia, in Europe as well, and across uh, North America, South America, um, People grow up and live in a very different digital environment, and that sets their experiences and their expectations when it comes to how they engage with businesses and brands and how they expect to be uh, spoken to. And again, just to pull um, to pull the thread that Tom started about China, I mean, it's no surprise we would all know just how different it is in China and the, the immense quality of service that Chinese digital ecosystem provides consumers. When Chinese come to Australia, that's their expectation uh, that they have. The second and final point I just wanted to really make is uh, about the families themselves. So this is not so much about the bit about a business lens, but just about their lived experiences. Um, there's uh, uh, when families come with children, uh, it's a massive uh, adjustment. It's really common for one spouse to come full time to Australia and for the another spouse to go back and forth or indeed maybe not to come at all. Um, the children are here, they're coming into a new school. And I just wanted to end with a, a, a quote I've heard um, on just how perceptive young immigrants can be. This comes from a 10 year old who moved from Beijing to Melbourne. And they said, Dad, we should have moved from Australia to China because that whole digital thing, it's so advanced. You've come the wrong way, Dad, coming from China <laughs> to Australia. So by understanding these experiences, we're 
we're setting ourselves up for success in in understanding them and being empathetic. Yeah, thanks, Izzy. Great. Well, there's a lot of points there. It's absolutely relevant to the topic of today. The diversity, uh, the different experience, the the migration journey. I think all of that play a part. It is something that we definitely need to be mindful when come to marketing and research and understanding. Now, Carissa, what's your view on this this top this topic? Thanks, Isabel, and hi to everybody. Um, so just to step back a little bit, um, and thanks to Tom and Sasha who've shared such, you know, sort of intricate stories around their experiences, but I think it's really relevant to call out the size of the prize and what multicultural Australia is looking like today versus where it's going. You know, I think mm -hmm. most people on the call won't debate the fact that um, Australia is increasingly becoming more multicultural. We are one of the most multicultural countries in the world, more so than the US, more so than the UK. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, in 2026, we're heading towards a 57% of our population considered multicultural. So the size of the prize is considerable and there is money on the table for brands. There is opportunity in the pipeline for brands and businesses to grow their customer base. Um, but there's also impetus for us, I think, to genuinely engage and authentically connect with these people who are making the big changes that Sasha talked to. Um, and a couple of other points I wanted to make is that, um, you know, there is a little misconception, I think, in the market that multicultural Australians are not necessarily affluent. Um, and they actually are. There are many studies that have been done that demonstrate not only their aspirational due to their migration journey and their propensity to want to create change and, and do things differently, um, but they, they have high disposable incomes in general. Um, and this is really interesting for marketers and for brands, I think, particularly if you're in, you know, in the health sector, in leisure, in retail, um, and, and you know, in finance and what have you. So there is there is a huge opportunity there, um, and I think it's something that we need to consider. And you know, to Tom and to Sasha's point, there is lots to get into when you think about different behaviours, different values and attitudes. But we can talk a little bit more about that through yeah. the through the call. Absolutely, I like the point that you make, Carissa. Uh, brands in Australia are generally trying to engage with our multicultural communities in the past but unfortunately majority of that relationship is very transactional it's not really meaningful or having certain depth that multicultural deserves so that's one of the things one of the challenges that we face um, so the other things that we want to talk about is the gaps uh, we know that inside and marketing often not very seamlessly integrated when it, when it comes to engaging and uh, marketing to our multicultural communities. And a lot of times the challenges such as, you know, it can be quite costly, quite complicated, and sometimes quite, quite slow or destroyed and ineffective. So um, despite what, like what you said, Carissa, despite we being a multicultural country, but often what we do is not really reflecting um, that uh, multicultural, that that uh, layers, you know. So, Derek, I'm very keen to hear your point of view and your hands-on experience. Yeah, thanks, Izzy. Hey, everybody. Yeah, um, certainly um, echoing a lot of what, uh, you know, Tom, Sasha and Carissa has already said when it comes to just the makeup of Australia. We live in a, such a fascinating and interesting place. Um, and one of the things that's uh, we uncovered from a MLA perspective, um, considering that uh, we're a bit of a, a non-for-profit body that um, does research and marketing on behalf mm -hmm. of the red meat industry. Um, so on behalf of you know beef and lamb farmers. So um, it's our job to you know put the word out there uh, with regards to the quality of the produce, um, and it is world class. So one of the things that uh, uh, we um, found out uh, from from sort of very early on segmentation studies was that uh, when it comes to beef and lamb, um, it's broadly enjoyed by um, a large, you know, sex segment of the population. So just to give you some context, uh, beef is eaten by more than 90% of Australian households um, and lamb is eaten by more than 70% of Australian households. So from a you know brand marketer perspective, if you look at those top line numbers, you'd be like, fantastic, job's done. I don't need to do anything here. <laughs> but it's when you actually, you know, look under the bonnet and then you actually look through the segmentation, that's when the aha moment um, came to us um, because it became uh, really apparent and really quickly that um, 
despite we were um, enjoying these um, these really um, good consumption numbers when it comes to beef and lamb, that certainly wasn't the case when it came to um, Asian households. Um, and that got us thinking, you know, what's actually driving the gap, um, particularly from a, from a lamb point of view, um, where we very, very quickly saw that um, what people chose to eat, you know, what people chose to shop, uh, whether that's dining out or cooking at home, um, a lot of it is really inherent behaviour. Um, mm -hmm. And if you didn't grow up in a country like Australia where, you know, sheep meat and lamb was such a big component of the family meal, um, all those experiences um, are quite foreign to you. Um, so our job as marketers then becomes, well, um, if there is an opportunity here, um, how do we go after it? But um, going after something, I think, really important is to, you know, first start off by understanding. Um, and that's the that's the path that we're on, you know, with with the team uh, from Cultural Pulse and from Bastion, um, just to, you know, try and learn a lot more about our, our audiences. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, Sasha, do you want to add in anything from your point of view? I mean, yeah, just maybe just to say, so uh, I've worked a lot in um, in research and communications research. And uh, if you've ever watched TV and watched a commercial break and watched an ad and just thought, this this isn't talking to me. This is this has got me wrong. Um, you know, at, at a minimum, you can be you can be just um, makes no memory, uh, but the, at an extreme, you can be offended by what's depicted in the way that your lifestyle or the way that your identity is depicted in advertising. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the risk that we have to take seriously as multicultural marketers is that the risk of getting it wrong in our communications, for example, it is profound and it's very hard to, to win back um, a potential customer that you have mm -hmm. offended by getting by depicting their life and um, their life experience uh, wrong. So yeah, I think that's a, a really important uh, point to make. And, and it does happen regularly, I have to say in Australia, yeah. Absolutely agreed. Well, Carissa, what do you think? Yeah, look, I agree 100%, Sasha. Thank you for sharing that. And I think it's it's not without good intent sometimes. I think there are lots of marketing teams out there who are looking to make positive change and they're looking at representation of talent in their advertising mm -hmm. and and, um, <clears throat> and in their content and brand campaigns to genuinely try and reflect, you know, the lifestyles or the lived experiences of those audiences. Um, <clears throat> but we see that too. There is some places where it's not done well. Um, and often it's not the only thing that's, you know, it, it, it's not enough, I think is probably, you know, putting putting multicultural talent in an advertising campaign is, is only a very small thing that brands can potentially do. Um, so that's one of the issues I think that we see regularly. The other thing that we're experiencing a lot with our clients is um, this idea that actually we're reaching all Australians. So through the existing channels that that they have enacted and and working with their media agency on there there's this sort of myth that needs to be busted that they're actually reaching multicultural communities through those channels um, <clears throat> we know through a lot of evidence and through some research that we've done for a client um, a few years ago <clears throat> excuse me my croaky voice um, that um, and it was for, for a banking client, the finance industry, we went out to talk to their customers to say, you know, how would you like the bank to reach you? How do you think is the most effective and impactful way um, <clears throat> to connect with you? And ast astoundingly, 83% of multicultural consumers don't want to be connected to through traditional mainstream channels. TV, radio isn't necessarily going to connect and I mean, authentically relate to them. Um, <clears throat> they want, they're much more... Um, trusting of referrals, word of mouth, peer-to-peer -peer networks, and those mm -hmm. are far more effective and influential. So you've got the content and the creative side, you've got the media side, 
<coughs> excuse me, but the media side as well, I think that needs um, some attention and some rethinking. Um, and think about how to unlock those communities and how to unlock those referral and P2P networks is something we really um, we think is a challenge and and something we come up against every day. And I think, um, Sasha, I think you mentioned it, or maybe it was Tom mentioned it as well, is that there's this belief that cost, you know, to, to reach multicultural communities is very, very costly because people are applying their models or their, I suppose, um, ways of working in mainstream to mm -hmm. reach multicultural communities and that's actually not the case um, mm -hmm. and we've got many examples of that through the work that we've done you can reach these communities very effectively and very directly um, mm -hmm. so I think that's something else worth you know calling out as a challenge is sort of overcoming that that uh, that understanding when we yeah understanding. I totally agree with you Chris and everyone um, I think the other thing is we see quite often is when we when brands and even government to some level when we want to engage with our multicultural communities one thing we do is to say hey let's translate into 20 different languages and to me that is a very band-aid a very it's almost like a shortcut you know these people that we're trying to target which is you know officially more than half of the population right now and you know to really engage with them and making sure we have a really good understanding and, and and really activate and convert, we need to understand them. We need to really dive into their personas, their their journey, their needs, their intention, because they are human, you know. So a lot of times what we need to do is really trying to understand them, not really, you know, jumping the to the quick band-aid or shortcuts. There's no shortcuts. So if we want to make things effective, if we want to convert, and if we want to build that relationship and that loyalty, we have to understand that. We have to do things in the proper way. Now, Tom, what's your view on this, on this sort of, you know, guess? Yeah, I, look, I, I, don't, I don't know if I can add much more other than kind of a, a course of agreement, but I, I would sort of, um, you know, caution people on the on the call to be curious. And, and I think that um, if anything, COVID um, highlighted how poorly we communicate with our multicultural communities. Um, and that I think we congratulate ourselves of being a multicultural um, you know, community. And I, often that just sort of gets distilled down to flags, food and festival and our festivals. And I really think that the the work that, um, you know, both your organizations do um, really provide um, an opportunity where by well-meaning um, and I think as Sasha said that idea of empathy is is really really um, important um, as a way of engaging and understanding and connecting with those communities is um, I think inherently Australians don't want to do the wrong thing and so um, but also can be kind of bound by um, not knowing how to connect or how to how to engage and i think you know working whether it's through your agencies with the research that, that can provide it and then obviously through activations and other things um it's so important if i just take the chinese community as an example picking up some of the things that have been mentioned and talked about it's not a homo homogenous um community absolutely uh, you've got yeah. uh you've got mainland chinese you've got intergenerational mainland chinese migrants that came at different times in different sections uh, you know, right back through to, you know, our, our dear friend, you know, Mark, who, who's, um, you know, family beat the poll tax and walked from Rome, um, you know, in the 1800s, um, through to, uh, you know, uh, Singaporean, Malaysian, Chinese, uh, East Timorese, Chinese, um, and Chinese. each of them have, yeah, absolutely, have different mm -hmm. um, different requirements and, and different, um, different touch points uh, for engagement. Um, and so I think sometimes, you know, so it was perhaps a little bit misrepresentative of me to say the size of the prize is this big because in different ways that's also quite fragmented and you do need a guide and people to help you um, articulate that so that you're really aware of um, how you speak to different people. And, you know, in some respects, the Chinese language media in Australia um, is probably one of the best ways um, to connect in on that. And so whether that's working with um, influencers or accounts and news sites, um, you know, or, or radio. And, and so I think um, it, it's it's not impossible, but it, it, it's one of those things that I think you have to kind of, um, rather than working off a template or an existing um, way that you, you traditionally communicate, 
you know, be open and be vulnerable to say, I don't really know how to connect with these people, but I'm willing to find out. Um, and, you know, I think you could do worse than bastion and cultural pulses as ways within which to 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 achieve that. I, I give you a, a last sort of story was, you know, when I worked at the AFL, there's been a lot of discussion around connecting with the Chinese diaspora to attend. And, and a, a lot of Chinese Australians do attend um, AFL games. But there was also this idea of particularly with the size of the international students that um, often it used to be that the game and the belief that people who run the game, that the game is so good that once you see it, you'll fall in love with it. And often that can be the case if it's a very exciting game. But um, I think for a lot of Chinese students, going to the MCG was like going to, you know, the Twelve Apostles or the Great Ocean Road. It was a, it was a thing. It's a bit like back in the day, if I'd gone to Spain, I might have seen a bullfight, but I wasn't going to follow the bullfighters or the bulls or understand the colours and the swords and the and the uniforms. Um, and so you have to find a way within which that you can make it um, valuable in the proposition within which the people um, from those communities who are you're competing, whether it's Korean dramas, um, you know, hot pot on the weekends or um, study and extra work. How do you fit in three and a half hours, um, you know, in a in a concrete coliseum uh, to uh, to uh, to watch something that you don't understand? So it, it's really just making sure that you, you understand the motivations and, and other things um, around that rather than just saying, yeah, if you build it, they will come. So, um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Thoughts. I like the example of AFL. I think we worked on that project together, Tom. Um, one of the challenges I remember AFL faced was uh, we have a good, uh, in terms of aware, brand awareness and also a presence even in China. That was really well done. Uh, but one of the challenges was conversion. And, and one of the strategies that we did in the end uh, together with AFL um, your time back in AFL, was focusing on the community, the Chinese community in Australia. And that is so important. One, because we do have a significant significant number of migrants coming from mainland China. And the other thing that's so important that Carissa and Derek both mentioned is they are your brand ambassadors, you know, while focusing on the um, on the cross border, you know, go to in market sort of uh, activation or marketing or communication. It's sometimes it's a lot more effective to focus on the our own multicultural community in Australia because they are the first the first line of defense and they are your brand ambassador and and the word of mouth and and vouching and all of that worked really well within multicultural community I think that is something that we a lot of the brands overlook and and if we if Come if awareness is something that you want to work on. Yes, sure, you can do in market stuff. But if conversion is your goal, then I would definitely recommend to start with local uh, multicultural community within our own backyard. That's that's one of the focus here. Yeah. Now, Derek, um, love the example you given. Uh, the little project that we did together with uh, CP. Uh, uh, um, cultural policy as well as MLA on this land piece. I like how you say that from the big number, it looks like we, you know, everything's great. Uh, but once you peel off, it's like onion, you know, you peel off the layers, you realize there's heaps of opportunities there for brands and organizations and businesses in Australia. I like you said, you know, a lot of um, um, multicultural communities probably taking and consuming lamb is not their, uh, you know, inherent sort of behavior. So how do we activate that? And once we peel more layers, we realize actually some, you know, particular segment do actually do that. You know, like they, it's, it, lamb is one of their key stable um, uh, meat, red meat for their uh, daily consumption. So things like that. I'd love to hear your your point of view. Um, you, if you want to uh, unfold that little project we did together and just probably giving uh, your point of view as a client and your experience working with uh, uh, Bastion CCI as well as, um, you know, cultural policy, that'd be really great. Yeah, sure thing. And I like that you use the onion analogy because that's one that I uh, quite often use myself. Uh, I'm a big fan of the onion analogy. Because um, we're foodies. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Yeah, look, I mean, um, and the layers of the onion were, were, were definitely interesting when we were peeling back um, 
um, just from an insight perspective, um, another thing that we um, sort of learned um, early on before engaging with Bastion and Cultural Pulse was um, just in terms of the size of prize. So getting back to that topic a little bit. Um, so what we had learned from our um, segmentation studies was that uh, when it comes to you know, purchase value of, of fresh meat overall um, and also um, purchase volume, so basically dollars and kilos, uh, we had actually learned a surprising fact, and that's um, when it comes to the different sort of cultural demographics, it was actually East Asians who, you know, not only bought the most fresh meat in terms of total uh, kilograms, but they also spent the most um, across the different um, cultural segments that we looked into. So, like, that's really interesting. Um, and the second thing that we noticed was, despite that, um, you know, beef and lamb weren't actually getting its fair share. So they were buying a lot, but they were buying a lot of, you know, everything else. Um, just not coincidentally, uh, beef and lamb, or as much as we would love people to be buying anyway. So we're like, okay, well, if the size of the prize is there, um, and we're not there, so we've certainly got to, you know, um, do a little bit more learning, a bit more understanding to figure out what are those barriers to, you know, choosing beef and choosing lamb when it comes to, you know, those those sharing meals, which are really important, um, especially if you're from an Asian or, you know, from a Chinese uh, background perspective. Um, so that was probably, um, I suppose, the point at which we were like, you know what, we probably need a little bit of specialist advice um, in this space because, even though, you know, I myself come from a Chinese background um, and I have, you know, spent time in China, Hong Kong and, you know, most of my life here, obviously. Um, there's a lot of skin in the game here <laughs> to uh, to uh, to um, to Sasha's point, perhaps um, there is a lot at risk if I got it wrong, <laughs> considering that I'm from the same culture. And so um, we began a bit of a learning exercise, if you will, where we engaged a team from Bastion and also Cultural Pulse to actually go out there and, um, you know, speak to people on the ground. So, you know, through the work, we spoke to a whole bunch of Chinese butchers. We spoke to Chinese retailers. We also went out and spoken to, you know, Chinese influencers as well as Chinese families. Um, and to cover that uh, diaspora of, um, you know, uh, multi-ethnic Chinese as well, which um, Tom touched on. So, you know, people from, you know, southwestern uh, parts of Asia um, who may identify as, you know, ethnically Chinese, they'll have, you know, slightly different nuances when it comes to, Absolutely. you know, needs, when it comes to flavour and food preferences. Um, so that was super, super interesting. Um, so I myself had, had, had learned a lot about my own culture, uh, mm -hmm. which is one of the you know, biggest positive surprises that um, came out of from a personal point of view. Uh, but from a professional point of view and from an MLA perspective, we've certainly, you know, walked away with a lot of knowledge now, which um, we're just about to, you know, work with Carissa and the team from Cultural Pulse to, um, you know, put some test activations in market because um, we've got, you know, two or three, you know, big questions in mind that we want to actually test, um, find out more um, in a real life, you know, setting through activations. And then from that, perhaps we've got the potential to, you know, scale those even further. Excellent. Derek, before you start this piece of, uh, you know, cultural research with us, as well as uh, market activation with uh, Carissa, um, do you foresee any difficulties, any challenges, any barriers, uh, any worries or concerns? Yeah, plenty of those. <laughs> uh, both both barriers and opportunities. Um, and I'll you know try and try and give you one of each. Um, the opportunity there is uh, no doubt massive um, because um, you know from a from a cold perspective, you know more than half of the population now identifies as from a cultural or linguistically diverse background. Um, and Australia as a country, our population growth is driven by migration, so that's only going to go one way um, and we've only I think scratched the surface because we've been talking about a predominantly ethnically Chinese you know background uh, mm -hmm. but there's so many different cultures and so many ethnicities out there that make up um, you know what we group as as cold um, mm -hmm. so definitely a massive opportunity mm -hmm. um, if I were to you know try and touch on barriers uh, you know we have 
limited resources. Um, mm -hmm. So even though we'd love to do everything, uh, we realistically, you know, can't, which is why we've, we've prioritized, um, I suppose, where the biggest opportunity might be for us right now. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of, you know, if I put it back to the gaps in consumption when it comes to beef and lamb, it's mm -hmm. uh, more likely, you know, people from an ethnically Chinese background. Um, mm -hmm. So figuring that out and figuring ways to engage with that audience, um, mm -hmm. you know, through the through the channel challenges that we touched on before when it comes to media. Um, mm -hmm. But I think, you know, overall, I do feel really positive about that um, mm -hmm. because even though ethnically speaking, we might be all different, we've got different, you know, media consumption mm -hmm. habits and mm -hmm. buying patterns and purchase behaviours. Um, mm -hmm. There is a lot of similarities too. Um, mm -hmm. So even to say, um, I might buy, you know, fresh meat from a, from a Chinese butcher that I'm really, you know, close to uh, mm -hmm. one week. I also shop at, you know, Coles and Woolies as well. So mm -hmm. we're all repertoire buyers um, and we've got, you know, much more similarities in behaviours than we actually realise and like to admit. So mm -hmm. for us as marketers, um, it's all about also finding out those commonalities so that even though there may be um, an adaptation that we want to make from a campaign perspective, if yeah. we can actually rely on what's more common um, than what's you know different um, that way uh, we can make our dollar stretch a bit further too. Absolutely. I think you brought up a really interesting point about who's your target audience? Who's your low hanging fruit? Who will you know, bring that conversion uh, quicker um, and more immediate. A lot of clients come to us to say, sure, you know, we do have 270 over different cultures made up this whole, you know, multicultural society. So obviously from a brand and business perspective, we cannot just, you know, reach out to this 270, you know, it's just impossible. And I like what you said, it's to find that commonality and also identify what brand you are, who's your target audience, who's, who's your low hanging fruit um, and uh, who you can build that long you know long-term uh, loyalty sort of uh, relationship and that's where we're gonna look into but many times it comes back to the size of the migrants again so just a bit of data uh, um, throughout there uh, Chinese and Indians are the uh, biggest uh, migration population right now in Australia um, and it's gonna continuously grow in the next five years um, and uh, uh, within the Chinese obviously like what Tom, Tom said is not homogeneous you know they are very 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 different. Uh, Indians and actually South Asians in general, we have a big numbers in both, uh, actually in all the capital cities so in, within different states. Um, so that's definitely something we, we wanted to look into because the conversion, the, the size of the price is really, really tangible. And it's, and you know, it's something that we need to think about. Big opportunities there. Now, Carissa, tell, tell us uh, from your point of view, from marketing, activation, um, all of that, you know, how how do you see this, you know, insight led activation, particularly helping our client from your experience? Yeah. Oh, there's so much to say, Izzy. Honestly, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's a big topic, so it's hard to sort of just. Get it is. It is. Three points. I think, um, you know, the thing we have touched on some of these things already, but um, the one thing I will just say um, to the community who are joining the webinar today is, don't do nothing. Um, you know, pick something to do. And there are lots of ways in. You can start with research as MLA are doing currently and thinking about, you know, what is, you know, what is the best way to understand the attitudinal differences and behaviours of the target market. So that is, you know, you know, a fabulous and very strategic place to start. Um, but it's not the only way in. Um, we've got clients at the moment who are looking at their current base, the current customer base and saying, okay, who have I got in my base? I think I've got a predominantly Asian community, but what does that actually look like? And when we've gone in to do the measurement and help them identify the, um, the cultural composition of their customer base or their employee base, we can do that as well. Um, they can actually find quite quickly that actually their high value customers are Asian or Indian or Chinese or whatever, Nepalese, whatever it is. And so that can be a great starting point. Um, so, you know, so so have a look at what you've got in your toolkit already to try and understand where the opportunity exists. 
you know, do simple things. If you've got creative, if you've got um, campaigns in market, test them and ensure that you're testing them with the multicultural target audiences that you're, you're looking to connect with. I think, um, you know, one thing people say, oh, yeah, that's gone into testing. It's like, okay, hang on a minute, who's on the panel? Who, who, you know, who are you actually testing with? Where's this feedback coming? Yeah. Oh, and I hadn't thought about that. So, you know, that's a really great place is just making sure that the communities you're talking to to sort of have a look at what how your work's going to resonate, think about what is the cultural composition of them and are they making up where you want to, you know, sort of target your communications. Um, you know, um, having a look at your media channels, we talked about that a little bit already, but, you know, bringing in the community to help um, sort of drive that resonance and drive that connection um, and that trust, which comes from that peer to peer and that referral network, is very, very innate in multicultural communities and, and really makes them tick. Like you can imagine somebody coming newly to this country on their sort of early migration journey, they're not necessarily looking at mass advertising to understand which bank or which telco they're going to choose. They're more likely to talk to an uncle or a friend or somebody already in the community has gone through that process. So, you know, wherever possible, have a look at how you might involve the community in your outreach and, and cultural policy have a great way to do that through our cultural ambassador network which, which is made up of thousands of community members so we help clients with that um, content we talked a little bit about that you know having a look at um, your the composition of your content and who your talent is is one thing but it's generally not enough and I would say go back to research and insights go back to have a look at understand deep understanding and you know to try and really authentically learn the behaviors patterns needs attitudes of your target audience and where you think the opportunity exists and try and bounce your creative and bounce your ideas and bounce your sort of strategy off that um so much more to say and the other thing I think so which, which reiterates a little bit of what Derek talked about is, you know, test and learn. It's a great way to try and identify where that opportunity exists, to see what might resonate, and then to be able to scale that. And if you've got, you know, if, if you're working in a model that has not um, um, engaged with multicultural communities successfully before, you've probably got a whole lot of people around in your stakeholder groups that's like, oh, do we have to do that? Or, you know, we don't really have the budget, or that takes time, and or, we don't have the skills to do that. And a test and learn is a great way to sort of debunk that myth and to give something a go and see the impact that you can create in a small way um, without completely disrupting the whole model. But I will say, um, and I say this back from the time that I've been a marketer and, and leading brands myself, is there is a need to disrupt some of the model in order to genuinely connect with these multicultural communities in a way that is authentic and creates, you know, and delivers resonance and impact. So hopefully yeah. that gives some ideas. Absolutely. I think this is a perfect gateway for me to talk about this partnership between Cultural Pulse and the Bastion CCI. So uh, I just want to articulate how this this whole th whole partnership looks like. Uh, and then Carissa, maybe you can perhaps talk about the application and what uh, our clients uh, could potentially benefit from this uh, this partnership. So the partnership looks like, you know, when Carissa and I um, we we actually working together for a little while and a lot of challenges and barriers and and the and the problems that we're facing are very similar. For example, what she said about, you know, you you have tested this, you know, who are you testing? What, what platform are you testing? So from a research perspective, we often heard and question client, oh, you've done research, but have you done this, this research? Uh, do you, did, did you do it in English? Do you do it in language? You know, have, have uh, a lot of these moderators or researchers have lived experience, understand cultural nuance. You know, a lot of these things make a huge difference. This is one of the things that come back to Derek's point, you know, without the lived experience, we wouldn't be able to identify the difference between the southern Chinese and the, the north, you know, east side of Chinese and how they consume red meat completely differently. You know, so these are the insights. These insights is where the nuggets is. A lot of times, so comes back to the uh the partnership. So we will start with a inside uh, research. We will do research, very targeted, highly strategic and agile sort of research design that's customized for this particular client or this brand. And then very quickly, um, we move on to working with creatives as well as client to come up with uh, creatives and concepts. And then we're going to obviously uh, get get into that creative design stage and then we then test these designs and very read very iterative sort of style and that process is probably uh, is probably going to take i would say 
um, as quick as five to six weeks, both research and creatives. And uh, um, what we one of the things that we can address with this partnership is we definitely shorten the overall research and, and activation and creative sort of process. Usually take weeks, months to do that. We can now shorten it and also cost effective. We also making sure uh, this this whole partnership is going to um, make it tighter and more agile and more adaptable to the actual problem business uh, objective and address it quickly in a in a very strategic sort of way. Now, Chris, I do want to talk about from your perspective and how this this will benefit our clients. Yeah, thanks, Izzy. I think you've covered quite a lot. There's not a lot more to say other than I think, you know, you hopefully people on the webinar can see that we are genuinely coming from the same place of good intent here and, and genuinely trying to um, help marketers and help the, the industry start with um, well-informed, insight-led um, creative and st strategic briefs that are based on the nuances of those cultures. So, you know, as I said, don't, don't, if you can't start with your research and you have to start somewhere else in your content or in your application, I would, you know, absolutely encourage you to do that. But, um, you know, I think the nice thing about this partnership is coming together, we're able to really help clients with that end to end, um, you know, talking a little bit before about the measurement tool. So we can also help in that sort of early research and understanding phase so we can work very closely together between Bastion and Cultural Pulse um, and having a look at the measurement of your current base and having a look at then what are the needs and attitudes and and behaviours and what have you that need to lead to good strategy and good work following that. Um, and then I think you're yeah, just being able to add the amplification model onto the work that Bastion are already doing in the research and insight space. Um, hopefully that's you know great value and and to Izzy's point efficient and effective for clients. Um, you know we can come to those things sort of quite quickly and I think very seamlessly and we've proven that we've been able to do that a couple of times now we've got some good examples where we work with clients collectively um, and it's yeah it's been a win-win for everyone so great doing more well it. yeah very well uh, Tom and Sasha do you have any anything to add on uh, before we opened up the floor for q and I mean um Thanks, Izzy. Just, I mean, just one one point, if I may. And I was um, so uh, Derek um, has has uh, said the word segmentation quite a few times, and it just kind of got me thinking. And this may sound a bit contrary as well, but you need to validate the need and validate the differences. Like we don't want to just assume that because because you're from this culture, therefore you have some amazingly different need that um, we need to cater to specifically and. It comes down, you know, um, I've worked with organisations, uh, they just have a bucket, uh, t telco, Carissa, they have a bucket, new Aussies, because no matter where you're from, you want convenience, good price, and a certain, you know, set of calling countries that are free, uh, and so on. Alternatively, I've worked with organisations where it's very micro, right down to the postcode of certain, you know, target mm -hmm. consumers. So. Yeah, validate the need through good segmentation work to determine Absolutely. that there is something that we have to do differently for mm -hmm. this segment. It's really important. Yeah, just on that point, segmentation is absolutely a very good way to understand our uh, the complexity of our multicultural communities. And often clients probably don't have the time or budget to do a full on full scale segmentation study. But what we can do is often build, uh, you know, psychographics in con conjunction with the demographics. And that, that has been worked really well uh, for quite a few of our clients in the past. Tom, do you have anything to add before we opened up the Q&A session? Oh, uh, yeah, just a couple of things. I think, I think just also on that idea of budget is that I think sometimes a lot of Australian businesses fail to understand the cost required to reach and to engage properly um, and to be aware of that uh, and not just to kind of think of it as an add-on but I mean very much to Sasha's point to to validate why you need to segment and where you need to segment and 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 to what extent. Um, AI is wonderful I love AI I use it a lot but just be so careful and obviously people who are on this call um, you know uh, are responsible but yeah I just think you know uh, you know this idea that you can click a button and things are translated or um, uh, mm -hmm. they may well be but it's you know garbage in and garbage out mm -hmm. 
language to understand the nuance of language and and the ability. I'll give you a good example. When I was um, at the AFL, very early on, we used to call um, Australian rules football "aushudzuo," which literally means Australia football. But for a Chinese speaker to hear football, that's referred to what very in Australia yeah. we often call soccer. Um, yeah. And it again reflects the myopic nature of either Victorian and Australians who think of football in terms of rugby league or um, mm -hmm. or AFL. And so by changing it to Ganlanchil, which means olive ball, so Aushu Ganlanchil, it followed a naming convention that is Meishu Ganlanchil, which is American football or yeah. American style football, and Yingshu Ganlanchil, which is rugby yeah. or American or union. So by then calling it Aushu Ganlanchil, um, it made it much more um, understandable for for Chinese audiences rather than um, Australian football because people would it's like conjuring up something like what what is that that doesn't make mm -hmm. sense whereas the the other framing of it and so I, I just say that it makes sense um, straight not, not away. That, yeah yeah not that we used AI back then but to to realise <laughs> that you you have to kind of understand um, the language the nuance, um, yeah. in in nuance absolutely. of that anyway yeah, yeah. absolutely. Great. Well, um, let's open up the Q and A um, session. Uh, let's open up the floor. Um, just if you have any questions, feel free to type into the um, the Q and A uh, icon on the top of the screen. If you can see right next to the chat. Um, so we have some couple, couple questions already coming in. What is the actual size of price and what's the actual data around it? Well, we have plenty of data around this, just given the time um, we mentioned this uh, earlier. Uh, right now, um, based on the last uh, run of ABS data, we have officially 51% of uh, uh, migrants living in Australia in terms of general population. And within that 51%, they are either born overseas or one of their parents born overseas. So it, it is not a minority anymore. I actually call this group of people the new majority, the new mainstream. So it is something that it's going to it's, it's gonna stay and it's going to continuously grow. Now, uh, all right. OK. Does the panel believe government or commercial business are more advanced, more genuine in talking to and adapting to needs of cold Australia, both in their comms but in the general too? So the question really, I don't know, the rest of the presenter, can you see the questions on Q&A? Okay, all yeah. right. Um, I have plenty to say about this, but I'm quite happy to pass this on to Carissa. Do you want to start um, uh, answering this question? Sure, Izzy, thank you. Um, look, I think I'll try and be quick, and I'm sure we're on the same page here, but um, go governments generally have some quotas around called audiences and who they need to reach and when and how, not across all of their communications, but a lot of them. So they are um, already have, I suppose, a remit within the business to focus on that or within the organisation to focus on that. So we see um, we see that coming through, um, and there are already budgets and funding committed to called audiences and, and engaging in multicultural communities. I think um, there are definitely some commercial businesses who are far ahead, and certainly in our experience in the last year or so, we are seeing sporting organisations really ahead of the curve in terms of you know engaging multicultural communities to grow their fan bases. So we obviously, for those who know us, worked on FIFA Women's World Cup last year. Um, we're talking to a number of other um, sporting tournaments and, and organisations at the moment, some who are further progressed down this path, but certainly many of them or all of them actually, and, and I'm talking across football, tennis, um, cricket, um, basketball, they have budgets allocated and, and targets set in terms of attendance and engagement. Um, with different community groups. So yeah, I'd say there are certainly some areas and commercial businesses who have further progressed. Um, but as I said, it's not to say anyone can't start. Yeah, and I also just to add on, I think in terms of engaging marketing, research, understanding of our multicultural communities, Australia in general, we are still at the very start of that journey. And it's this it's a long journey, but we started. And there are few organizations and brands uh, have actually made that start, uh, but we still have a long way to go. But now that you're here today in this webinar, that means that you know we're collectively on that journey. So that's most important. 
Um, I quite like this question. Um, you know, wondering if panel uh, from Jack, wondering if panel could please provide some examples of Australian companies getting it right and uh, uh, getting it wrong, some key learnings that we can take from them, their mistakes. Um, I think we mentioned bits and pieces throughout the discussion, but Carissa, uh, I probably can start with something. Uh, one thing I mentioned is a lot of organization. Um, one thing is they're a little afraid because it's complex and then there's a lot, of, a lot of misperception thinking it's difficult to approach and engage with our, our multicultural communities and we don't really end up doing anything meaningful. So I think making that start, like Carissa, Carissa said, making that start is most important and do something about it. That's most important. Um, and don't just do translation. That's another thing I want to reiterate. Mm -hmm. It's engaging with our multicultural communities, not just about communication, you know, translating. Communication is much Far, far, far more important than that. Um, and the other thing I want to say is, um, yeah, segmentation, but don't be so afraid of, uh, you know, stacking on the um, demographic side of things. Really get into their psyche, their needs, their intent. Um, treat them like human, you know. So that's something that I definitely say, um, invest into that. And also, like what Tom's point, invest into understanding them. You know, a lot of times we treat them like minority or value add or by the way, but they are, like we said, you know, collectively, they are half the population now or more than half the population now. So they do deserve that attention, deserve that investment. That's from me. Carissa, do you have anything yeah. to add? Um, I was just going to say, um, yeah, we've seen a number of businesses over the last year or so um, definitely getting it right. And I would say it's the ones that are starting with their insight and with their measurement is understanding, you know, who are their cultural um, communities that they're servicing now, who are best resonating with their brands and what are their behaviours, needs and attitudes and values and then bouncing from that. So I think um, that is definitely um, one we've seen of late, we were working with a property development business that knew they were over-indexing in their um, Asian um, audience or Asian customers. And as I said before, I think I mentioned that they then understood that they had sort of over 80% who were either Chinese or Indian. And as a result of that, they've now started to think very deeply about what does the sales process look like? What does, you know, the development of the houses actually look like? And how does that reflect the lived experiences of the communities that they're serving? Um, and what do their communications and marketing say um, and do in terms of resonating and connecting? So there are definitely some businesses out there who are doing it well. I'd be very happy to talk in more detail offline um, if anyone wants to sort of, you know, to chat a bit further. I know Izzy will do the same. So, um, yeah. Conscious All right, time. we're yeah, <laughs> just quick. very mindful of time. Um, before we end this uh, webinar, um, anyone from the panel, anything to add? Uh, any last word? <laughs> yeah, I've just got a really brief message. Um, and uh, you know, the the cold space and cold engagement space, it's it's super interesting, and there's a lot more that we can do, a lot more that we can learn as a collective. Mm -hmm. Um, so one thing that I'll just say is, uh, you know, be curious, stay curious and uh, yeah, don't presume because that's the <laughs> biggest mistake anybody can make. <laughs> brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. All right. I'm going to end this webinar today. Spot on one hour. <laughs> I hope everyone um, have, you know, gotten enough uh, insights and, and probably making you think slightly differently now. That's the purpose of this uh, webinar. Feel free to reach out to all of us. And thank you so much for being here today. Thank you.